So we'll now move on to Dr. Eakin's talk. So Dr. Eakins is, she graduated in 2017 and is now a pediatric doctor in the South of England. So alongside her work in the NHS, she also helps med medical school applicants get into medical school by sharing advice, reviewing personal statements and conducting mock interviews. In her spare time, she also volunteers as a doctor within St. John Ambulance. She also enjoys running, baking and anything creative. So now we'll hand over to Dr. Eakins. Hello, uh, thank you for that introduction. That's, um, it's not, nice, nice to be here, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I was basically going to talk you through um, the journey that I've taken to becoming a paediatric trainee um, and how uh, that sort of might apply to you and then what a day in the life of a, of a paediatrician is like. Um, and you might start to see some of the differences between um, life as a, G as a GP, which we've heard about with Dr. Zerva, um, and then life as a paediatrician, uh, which I'll go into. Um, the sorts of things that I will talk to is, is not specific just to paediatrics. Um, it could apply to any hospital specialty, really. Um, the training pathways are quite similar um, and the day in the life um, is sort of relatable to multiple specialties. Um, so if you're not interested in, in paediatrics, but you might be interested in any, any hospital specialty, it's still, uh, still worth listening to, hopefully. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to um, go back to sort of when I was at the same stage as you guys are now and how I sort of got started. Um, so when I was a really young kid, I wanted to be an author, didn't want to be a doctor at all, hadn't even crossed my radar. Um, and then I realised that that was kind of a, an unrealistic career. It wasn't something that you could go to a job interview for and become an author. And it was all based on luck. Didn't like the idea of that. <laughs> um, and my granddad suggested that I think about being a doctor. Um, at the time, I was um, in the second from bottom set for science. So I really wasn't sort of having the right grades and things to um, go on to, um, to be a doctor at that point, but I was only 12. So there was time to sort of um, catch up as it were. Um, I didn't really know anything about being a doctor at all. None of my family were doctors, didn't have any family friends or anybody who, who was in anything medical or healthcare related at all. So it was something I hadn't really been exposed to previously. Um, so there were basically, there were four things that I did um, to get from that stage of a 12 year old in the sort of one of the bottom groups of science with no contacts in medicine um, to actually getting in. Um, so the first one was working on my grades. Um, I knew that in order to do medicine, you had to do um, two science A levels, chemistry and one other one. Um, and at my school, in order to do that, you had to have done triple science GCSE. And in order to do that, you had to be in the top set for science by the end of year nine. So I worked that backwards, worked out what I needed to achieve and worked hard to, to do that basically. Um, and then did well enough at GCSE and A-levels to um, make that work. Um, then work experience wise, I know work experience at the moment is a real nightmare. Um, the, the bullet point list there is the things that I did for work experience. So um, I did some time in hospital shadowing staff. It wasn't all doctors. I shadowed physiotherapists and nurses and receptionists as well. Um, because anything like that does give you an insight into how the NHS works and it, um, it gives you exposure to that multidisciplinary team, um, which is sort of a buzzword that people use at interviews quite a lot. Um, I also did a week at a primary school um, purely because another work experience placement was cancelled and that was all I could all I could arrange at short notice was going back to my old school. Um, but actually that was still useful um, because I could then talk about how um, teaching the young children had helped, uh, helped me develop my communication skills and that, that could be applicable to medicine um, and sort of that sort of caring, looking after people in the school also can apply in hospital as well. So even though that wasn't healthcare related at all, it has transferable skills to medicine. Um, I did some volu uh, voluntary work with disabled children at a sort of local um, play centre, basically where kids could go for the day. Um, um, give their parents a, a breather and some time out and we would look after the, the children for the day. Um, and I started volunteering with St John Ambulance, which I still do to this day. So I've been doing that since I was 14. I'm now 26. So I've been doing that for about 12 years. Um, and I had a Saturday job in a pharmacy, which um, again, although not, not directly working with doctors, um, gave me more of an insight into um, healthcare in general, um, basically. So we, we sometimes talk about what what actually is good quality work experience and really it's anything that either gives you an insight into medicine and or has transferable skills to medicine so going back to that that um, work experience in a primary school it didn't give me an insight into medicine at all because it wasn't healthcare related but it did have transferable skills 
Um, and it's also, it also needs to be something that you can reflect upon. Um, so it's no good going in um, and watching um, a whole, whole week of a doctor going around a hospital if you then don't reflect on it and learn anything from it. Um, but your work experience does not have to be shadowing a doctor. And I think at the moment, um, medical schools are gonna be particularly aware that that won't have been possible for, for really anybody. So that I don't think there'll be any, any expectation or requirement for it to have been um, directly shadowing a doctor or working in a hospital. Um, so having sorted out my academic grades and work experience, the next thing was to sort out the UK CAT, which is now called UCAT. Um, so I worked out which medical schools I wanted to apply to, and it happened that they were all UCAT universities rather than BMAT. Um, in the year that I applied, there were about 36 medical schools. I think there's now about 42. Um, and at the time, only five of those were BMAT. Now a lot more of them do BMAT. And it happened that um, the ones that I wanted to, um, to apply to were all UCAT universities, which was the majority of them at the time. Um, whether you're doing the, B, the BMAT or the UCAT, or even both, if, you, if, the, if the universities that you want to go to, if some require the UCAT and some require the BMAT, whichever one you're doing, start your preparation early um, and use a mixture of resources. When I applied, uh, so I was a 2012 entrant, so um, I was preparing for my UCAT in the summer of 2011. At that time, there weren't really any online resources, so I just used a couple of textbooks which, which were full of um, practice exam questions. Those sorts of books are still available, they're fantastic, but you now also have lots of online resources. Um, I don't know whether that's something that, that Medify offers, but I know that there's a company called Medify who have a question bank, um, but there's, there's loads of online resources and things. Um, so you use a mixture of different, different things, do loads of practice questions, and if there's a topic that keeps coming up that you're struggling with, then um, spend extra time on that, revise that topic. Um, you might find that if there's something perhaps in GCC maths that you struggled with and it's a topic that you need to know um, to do well on the UCAT or the BMAT, uh, that might be worth going back through your notes for. So revising those weakest topics would be my advice for that. And then having done the UCAT, the last thing left really, apart from a personal statement, um, was the interview. Um, for interview prep, my advice would just be to start reading about current healthcare issues and medical ethics topics now, whether you're um, applying to medical school this coming September um, or October even, um, or not for a couple of years. When you come to interview, they'll want you to um, be able to talk about uh, healthcare issues um, that have cropped up over the last few years. And so if you start reading now, you won't have as much of a backlog to sort of trudge through. It's much easier to read about the stuff that's happening now and try and keep on top of it than a week before the interview to have to read two years worth of healthcare news. <laughs> um, and the same goes with medical ethics. Um, those topics don't tend to move on quite so quickly, um, but being aware of these sort of medical ethical um, pillars and medical ethical issues will help you. Um, Familiarising yourself with common interview topics so you know what kind of questions you're you're gonna you're gonna be facing is a good start. And then just doing loads of practice um, with anybody who will listen um, and try and do under timed conditions. So that was that's my sort of how I approached the stage that you guys are all at now um, and my advice for it. I'm really quickly going to talk about medical school and foundation years before I talk about the day in the life of the paediatrician or the hospital doctor, which is the main uh, main bit. So step one was all about getting into medical school. Step two is once you're there. Um, so I was at medical school for five years. I studied in Brighton. Um, at medical school, you basically, you learn about the most important diseases. You have placements with most of the specialties. And um, there are some of the more niche specialties that you might not, um, that you might not get exposure to. And during all those placements, pediatrics really took my interest. Um, I became interested in pediatrics towards the end of the first term of my first year. Um, we had a couple of lectures that term on paediatrics and I found those much more interesting than the adult lectures, to be honest. Um, and then when it came to shadowing people on the wards, um, I found the children's wards much more um, fun and interesting than the adult wards. Um, during medical school, you also get the chance to have some research experience. So um, that can either be sort of, everyone has to do a project that's sort of built into their degree, which is a research project. Um, but there's also the option to do an extra year out to do additional research or additional studies in something related to medicine, um, just to widen your um, knowledge base, I guess. 
I didn't do that. Um, I just did the standard five year programme. And there are loads of societies and extracurriculars at university as well. Um, and there's just a picture of me graduating with my family. <laughs> um, so from there, I then went on to my foundation years. Um, so your foundation training is the first two years of being a doctor um, after you graduate from medical school. And they're uh, usually known as F1 or FY1 uh, and F2. Um, they consist of six rotations in total across the two years. Each of them last four months. So you do three rotations in F1 and three in F2. And the idea of that is to give you a broad range of experience and to get further insight into some of the specialties that you might be considering. Um, at that point for me, I'd, as I said, I'd uh, sort of had my heart set on paediatrics since quite early on in, in university. Um, several people tried to dissuade me and, and say that that was, uh, oh, sorry about that, I'm going to talk. Um, <laughs> they tried to dissuade me and say that paediatrics was a bad idea um, and sort of saying, oh, you'll have no work-life balance if you become a hospital doctor. Um, you won't have time to have your own family, and uh, which is something that, that's really important to me. Um, and sort of saying, oh, you, you, you shouldn't do that. You should do something that's based in, in the community um, so that you haven't got to do night shifts and weekends and things. Um, I didn't listen to that. I still wanted to become a, 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 a paediatrician. Um, I thought, well, um, other people have made it work. I'm, I'll be able to, too, basically. Um, there's always options for working less than full time and um, doing things like that, as, as Dr. Zerber has mentioned as well. Um, so you, you can mix, gen, uh, mix in family work or family life with work, sorry. Um, so yeah, I wasn't put off of paediatrics um, by that. So yeah, I then completed my foundation training and went off to become a paediatric specialist trainee, which is where I am now. Um, so paediatrics is an eight year pathway after you've completed F2. Um, I'm in my second year of those eight years. Most hospital specialties um, after you complete F2 need another six, seven, eight years of training after F2. Um, in that time, you're working um, in different hospitals or different departments, perhaps within the same hospital, um, where you gain an exposure to um, the specialty that you're wanting to pursue. So because I'm doing paediatrics, I've so far had um, one year in a general paediatric hospital and then this year um, I'm uh, working in a neonatal unit for the entire year so just dealing with babies um, and then next year I'm going back to a general paediatrics unit um, there'll be other placements where I'll be working in community paediatrics um, etc so you you get a broad range of experiences to do with your specialty um, but they, they do keep moving you around different departments and hospitals to give you that range of experience um, and that applies to any specialty, really. Um, there are several exams to do during specialty training. Again, that applies to, to any specialty. For paediatrics, there are four exams um, to do after you finish F2. Um, and then once you've finished your eight-year uh, eight training pathway and you've done all your exams, um, you can then um, apply to be a consultant, basically. Um, so for most people, that's when they're um, into their mid-30s, at least. Um, so I'm now just going to take you through a day in the life of being a paediatrician, um, which again is very, very similar to any, any hospital specialty. And then I've got three cases which are more specific just to paediatrics. So the day in the life, um, my day starts fairly early. I get up about 6.30, left the house by 7.30 and we start work by 8 a.m. Um, the same goes for most, most specialties. Generally surgical specialties will start earlier than medical specialties. Um, we start the working day with something called morning handover, um, which is when the team who've been looking after the patients overnight um, tell the team who's coming in for the day about all of the patients um, so that there's um, sort of continuity um, in the care that we're giving to our patients and everyone's on the same page about what we're doing. Um, that takes about half an hour. And then we have a teaching session um, for another half an hour um, where one of the consultants um, will teach us about a uh, a relevant topic or discuss an interesting case that we've had recently. Um, we then do the ward round, which takes the rest of the morning really. Um, that's when the group of doctors, so um, the consultant, a registrar and the, the SHOs or um, the more junior trainees, um, we go and see each patient in turn um, and we identify the problems that they're having, um, perhaps talking to the parents and the nursing staff who are looking after them. Um, to help solve that and we make a plan with them that everybody can agree on 
Um, so whether that's perhaps doing some extra investigations to work out um, why the patient is having having that problem, so that might be different blood tests or scans, um, or if we already know what the problem is, prescribing a medication to try and make it better, um, or perhaps liaising with someone from a different specialty, like the paediatric surgeons, to see whether um, the child will benefit from a surgical procedure. Um, around 12 o'clock, we finish the ward round, um, and then we divide up the tasks um, from the ward round that we generated um, for the remainder of the day. So uh, all of those investigations and treatments and things that we discussed on the ward round need to have something like they, they need to be actioned for them to actually happen. Um, and so we divide those tasks up between them and we call them the jobs. Um, so from that point onwards, um, we spend the rest of the day completing these jobs basically. <laughs> So, as I said, this is a mixture of um, prescribing, um, sorting out x-rays and scans, um, different procedures like taking blood, um, putting in uh, long lines or um, number punctures, things like that. We do that quite a lot in neonates, um, talking to other specialist departments and updating the patient's families. Um, particularly with COVID at the moment, um, the patient's families aren't all in hospital all the time. Um, Generally, most children's hospitals will allow one parent to stay with the child 24-7, but the other parent has to be away from the hospital. So they often like to be phoned to be updated about what's happening. Um, and in neonates, um, the ward is basically uh, a large room full of lots of baby cots. Um, and so, or incubators really. Um, and there isn't a facility for the parents to stay 24-7 with their child. So they come and go. Um, which means that there's a lot of talking to parents and um, updating them about the progress that their baby is making. Um, so that takes the rest of the day, squeeze in some lunch somewhere in, in, in amongst that, um, all of that uh, manic job, <laughs> job doing. Um, then about 8 p.m. we have evening handover, which is where the team for the night come back and we tell them about what, what we've done during the day. So there's this sort of closed loop of, uh, of communication where um, we talk to them morning and night so that um, we know what's what's happening all the time, basically. And then about 9 p.m. we go home. Um, at any point during all of that, um, emergencies can crop up, which you have to go to straight away. So even if you're in the middle um, of doing something else, if there's an emergency, that takes priority and you have to go and deal with that. Um, and in a typical day um, on, the, on the neonatal ward or in general paediatrics even, um, I would typically get called to one, two, three emergencies. It's unusual to have more than that, but it's possible. Um, and the same, like this, this, um, this day in the life pattern applies to the vast majority of hospital specialties. Um, they all have this sort of uh, handover, ward round, doing jobs um, kind of uh, structure to them. And emergencies can obviously happen in, in any specialty. So I'm now going to talk about some of those things I might get called to go and see. So in general paediatrics, um, the wheezy child is a very common, very common problem. So um, we've got a three-year-old boy who is attending A&E accompanied by his mother, um, and you're called to go and see him as the paediatrician. Um, so you take a history from him, you find out um, from the mum, because obviously the three-year-old boy isn't going to be able to tell you all of this. Um, the mum says that he's had a runny nose and a cough for a couple of days, but today he's become more short of breath and wheezy, uh, which is kind of a whistling kind of noise that he makes when he's breathing, if you, if you haven't come across a wheeze before. Um, his shortness of breath and his wheeziness is stopping him from being able to run around and play as normal. And he's just not really interested in doing the things that he normally enjoys and eating and drinking. Um, this has happened a few times before. Um, and his only other medical problem is eczema. Um, after you've done a history from a patient, the next thing that we normally do is, is examining them. Um, and so when you go to examine him, you find that his chest is wheezy um, and he's having to put extra effort in, into his breathing. Um, you check his oxygen levels and they're a little bit low and they're 91%. We'd like them to be sort of from the mid nineties upwards really. Um, so because his oxygen levels are low, he needs to receive oxygen um, through sort of like an oxygen mask kind of thing. Um, and we give him some medications as well to open up his airways to treat that wheeze. His breathing gets a lot better. Um, but because he was quite poorly when he came in, he's admitted to the hospital overnight to monitor his, his condition. Um, that's something that we often do because as these medications wear off, 
the shortness of breath and the wheeziness can come back only a few hours later and then you're back to where you started um, and so it's much safer to observe the child for a few hours to make sure that um, that when the medications wear off they're not going to be much worse again so we often keep children in for, an, for a night um, so you've just finished seeing that child you're about to go and um, do some paperwork or whatever else you, you, you might be up to um, but then your bleep goes off um, because somebody's having a baby um, which we have we obviously attend um, as paediatricians and in neonates um, so there's an emergency cesarean section um, for a lady who is 32 weeks pregnant, which is about seven months. So the baby's being born a bit early. Um, she's delivered by cesarean section. And then when the baby goes, uh, comes out, she's, uh, she's pale, uh, she's floppy, she's not breathing, and she has a slow heart rate. So this is an emergency. Um, th this baby is clearly not very well. Um, you need to resuscitate her, basically, to... Um, to perk her back up again. Um, you managed to do it successfully um, by managing her airway and um, ventilating her with a special, uh, special kind of mask. Um, and within about five minutes of starting that resuscitation, um, she's breathing by herself, her heart rate is normalized and she's pinked up nicely. She's a nice healthy pink color. Um, babies do get better very quickly with this sort of thing. Um, a, a baby resuscitation is usually much quicker than an adult one. Um, the process of going from um, being a, a baby inside a womb to um, where they're obviously they're not breathing um, <laughs> because they don't need to, um, to being outside of the womb. Sometimes the babies just don't really adjust straight away and they just need a little bit of extra help and support to start breathing. And particularly because this baby's being born um, quite a few weeks early, that's, that's more likely to happen. Um, but in the vast, vast majority of cases, we managed to, sex to successfully resuscitate babies um, there's a much higher success rate for um, resuscitating a newborn versus an adult. Um, and then just as you're finishing up with that one, your bleep goes off again and you're called back to children's A&E, um, this time for a teenager um, who is having palpitations and is sweating. Um, after you've done your, your brief history, um, you examine her and you find that yes, she has got a fast heart rate um, but she otherwise examines normally. Um, you run the ECG, which is, uh, as Dr. Zerva um, said in her talk, you, um, you put these, these electrodes on the patient's chest and their limbs um, to get an electrical tracing of their heart. And it shows tachycardia, which is a medical word for a fast heart rate, um, but the ECG is otherwise normal. Um, so that's reassuring. Um, you speak, you've, you've now bought yourself a bit more time because you've ruled out lots of emergencies you'd have to deal with straight away. Um, now you've bought yourself some more time, you speak to her in a bit more detail and you find out that she's feeling anxious about going back to school after COVID. Um, she's due to go back to school in the next couple of days um, and she used to be bullied when she was at school and she's worried that the bullying will restart when she goes back to school. Um, so it sounds like um, the palpitations and the sweating episode is perhaps more to do with anxiety or panic attack rather than a medical problem. We've ruled out um, any significant heart arrhythmias with a normal ECG and the normal examination um, is also um, uh, very reassuring. Children and teenagers who have chest pain and palpitations, it's, a, it's only ever actually a cardiac, or, uh, like, a, like a cardiac cause, so something to do with the heart. In, a, in about eight to ten percent of cases, um, so in an adult with palpitations, you might go a little bit further looking for for heart problems. But in a um, in a young person who has no cardiac history at all and with a normal ECG, um, you can be pretty sure they're in the ninety percent where it's not a heart problem and it's something else that's causing causing those symptoms. Um, so because this isn't um, a cardiac or, or medical problem as such, um, she doesn't need any medical care. Um, but you contact the school nurse to tell them about the teenager's anxiety um, so that she can be supported when she returns to school. Um, so part of a paediatrician's job is liaising with um, the other people who uh, look after these children and teenagers, so whether that's uh, the parents, the school, um, those are the main two really. Um, that's really important, that sort of holistic care um, that we give to children and teenagers. Um, so those were just some of the cases that we might might see in, in, an, in an average day um, and that overview of that, that journey of how I got there. <laughs>